Dr. Siambi, thank you everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. Um, I would like to to show to speak as I show a couple of uh, of slides. So if you will please allow me to share uh, to share my screen. I hope we can see that. Um, so I want to talk about inclusive and healthy food systems in Africa. As Dr. Siambi said, my name is Jemai Manjuki and I just joined IFPRI as director for Africa based in um, uh, in Nairobi at the moment. Um, and what I'm going to present to you is adapted from the IFPRI Global Food Policy Report uh, 2020. Um, and I want to start by just saying, um, at the moment, we have a strong imperative for making sure that the food that our food system produces is, is healthy, that the food system is inclusive, and that it is sustainable, that we are producing for everyone, um, that everybody has access to healthy food, but that that food, we are also producing it in a way that's sustainable uh, to our environment. And there's a lot of data that's pushing this agency. This is data from 2018, but we've seen even from the state of food insecurity 2019 that we still have close to a billion people that are, um, are hungry. This number is going up. And while it is going up, we are also struggling with overweight and obesity, not just in uh, developed countries, not just in urban areas, but also in lower and medium income uh, countries, as well as in rural areas. Uh, we still have climate change um, as, a, as a challenge, and we know the contribution of agriculture to that is, is about 24% uh, of, of in the greenhouse uh, gases. But we also know that most of the people that are most affected by climate change still have very little power over the nature and speed of um, mitigation and adaptation actions. And I wanted to start with what, what do our current food systems look like, and, and especially for, for, for Africa. Um, and we see, um, compared to other regions, small farms still account for about 11%, uh, where 11% you know, of the world's farmland is, um, is smallholder farms globally in Africa and South Asia. This goes up to 40%. Um, 40%. Um, despite uh, this, we see the value of that production is not as high as we would like it to be. And what we are seeing now is that as food systems uh, transform, the importance of the middle um, you know, this, this middle between production and, and consumption is increasing, whether it is transportation in terms of how food is being distributed, whether it is uh, processing, and this creates a huge opportunity to actually promote inclusion of, uh, of, of the rural poor. Uh, so there is an emerging role for SMEs in food supply in, in Africa. Um, what we see from the Global Food Policy Report is 80% of domestic food supplies in Africa are now purchased in markets, handled by the private sector, uh, primarily small and medium um, enterprises. And only 20% of food is remaining within farm households for their own consumption. And this is an opportunity and a challenge in, in several ways. A challenge because we know that from the state of food and insecurity that about two thirds of that number of hungry people that I showed are actually in rural areas and in many cases are smallholder producers. So we are also having insufficient food for smallholder producers. An opportunity in the sense that we have a growing um, SME sector that's actually helping to move food 
to process food and to move it from where it is produced to where um, to where it is consumed. So you see there's 80%, that's uh, six, in, in Africa, 64% is small and medium enterprises and 16% is large uh, enterprises, which means that investments also have to be going into some of these small and medium enterprises. As this is changing on the production and the distribution side, on the consumption side, um, things are all also uh, changing. There are changes in supply and demand for food products, and this is driving growth in off-farm segments of agri-food uh, systems. The share of own consumption in rural food production is falling. And this is accompanied by a shift to marketed production of more profitable vegetables and animal source um, and animal source foods. But what we also say, see is the urban share of the food market uh, rising rapidly. Um, if if 80% of the food is actually moving from where it is produced to where it is being consumed, and this is raising demand for much more diverse um, diverse foods, and you can see in this in this table also showing some the share of agri food value chain segments and their contribution uh, to, to 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 GDP. What this shows that uh, is is that while many studies are showing that um, agricultural growth is more effective than agricultural growth in reducing uh, poverty, that investments can't just go to productivity uh, alone. That the growth in these other food systems aspects of food systems, such as processing and, and trade and transport, it's actually showing is as effective as what we termed before agricultural growth, if not more um, so at reducing, uh, at reducing poverty. And these sectors, the, all these subsectors of the agri-food system are actually growing uh, much faster than agriculture itself in the, in the last couple of years. When we look at the national food systems from, from, uh, from sort of a transitional um, uh, point of view, our national food systems are also transforming rapidly from being traditional to, to modern. And you can see what here the report defines as, as traditional and as, um, as, as, as modern. Um, let me just hide this. Here, the, the traditional is defined as where the policy focus in food, in, is on food security and supply and cereal production, where the share of agriculture is to, in GDP is greater than 25%. Food is being eaten to where it is grown, and there's a lot of sustainability focus on climate uh, adaptation, very limited industry, and most calories are from uh, cereals. But our countries are transitioning and transitioning very quickly to where there is a policy focus on expanding. Um, to the policy focus is expanding not to just getting enough food, but also micronutrient intake, dietary diversity, agriculture transformation. Um, the share of GDP from agriculture uh, reducing, increasing rates of urbanization and sustainability issues a little bit much more complex. Industry is, is, is growing and there's a decreasing share of calories from, from, from cereals to sort of what we call the modern food system um, where there's a high rate of uh, urbanization, where big industry is playing a, a, a large role. And we see that a lot of the African countries are actually between this traditional and, and transitioning. But this has a lot of implications for what we do. Uh, it has a lot of implications from what governments um, governments do. Um, it defines what our entry points uh, for policies and for 
programs are, but also what trade-offs we actually must um, we, what trade-offs we actually must make. Um, and this is the types, the different kinds of reforms that are needed, depending on whether, as a country, we are dealing with a traditional food system, a transitioning food system, or a modernizing um, food uh, food system. And this is very critical because there is still a lot of government, a lot of policies that are focused on a very traditional kind of food system when their food system is actually already in, in transition. So if you can, if you think about the the, the 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 putting diet fast in a traditional system, you want to promote the production of nutrient uh, dense foods in a transitioning system where that nutrient nutrition transition is already happening. You want to focus a lot on nutrition education or information campaigns around healthy eating because diets are already are already changing. When you are in a modernized uh, food system, which we are we are getting to some of our countries are getting into. We're thinking about packaging labels. How do consumers make decisions about um, about what they eat? In terms of the food innovation and technologies that need to be happening in a traditional system, you are thinking more about biofortification. I've seen somebody from Harvest Plus on the panel, hoping they'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, in a transitioning system, you are thinking more about food quality certific certification. As mo food starts moving in, in, in longer distances, then issues of certification, issues of safety, issues of cold chain innovations then become uh, important. And in a much more modern system, then it's the infrastructure and, and, and logistics. And you can see how other innovations, including around policy and inclusive and reforms also change depending on, on, on where we are in this transition process. Okay, jo Jemima, yeah. <laughs> I'm not getting to the time, so if you could start wrapping up, please. Um, in fact, I, I just have two more uh, last slides because I do not want to leave this discussion without also talking about that our, our food systems don't just need to be to be um, healthy and sustainable, but they also need to be to be equitable. And we have to think about how we include young people and women in how do we get the voices and the innovations that young people bring into the into the into the food system and despite facing really significant uh, challenges young people young men and women and other women are playing an instrumental role both within the farm and also beyond the farm we've seen a lot of innovations from young people around that the middle of of transportation logistics a lot of women in the in the in, in the SME, in the SMEs. So we need to have this more positive outlook on, on our young populations, not thinking of them as, as a problem, but actually as agents of change that are really needed in the Africa food system um, at the moment. Because it's if we invest in these food systems and in young people, we are not only creating jobs for them, but we are also helping Africa and, um, and beyond um, you know, address this issue of concentration of, of global poverty in, in rural places. I'm going to stop there, uh, Dr. Siambi. Moses, you're on mute. Oh, thank you, Jemima. Oh, thank you, Joanna. Yeah, before we move on to the next speaker, I have some two questions, clarifications that I would like to hear your views. You are talking about dietary diversity and mainly because of the products that are getting into the urban areas. Are we seeing similar trends in the rural areas in Africa? And if any, do you have an example? And then uh, my second question is coming to equity. As you move to processing and you say getting into the SMEs, are we seeing a lot of participation of women as we see in the production part of the value chain? Uh, 
Thank you, Dr. Siambi. I'll, I'll start with your last one in terms of equity and, and, and SMEs. We are actually seeing a lot of women in the, in the SMEs and especially the food sector um, SMEs. In fact, I think we are the only continent at the moment where we have more female entrepreneurs and, and, and more women in, the, in, in uh, small and medium enterprises than any other, um, than any other continent. But what research is actually showing is that their profitability levels are actually much lower. Um, there's, there's a World Bank study from last year that's actually showing sometimes um, female-owned businesses in the same sectors as male-owned businesses can sometimes be 30% lower in profitability because of some of the constraints around, uh, around labor and the, and the financial gap. Um, the gender gap in in financial in financial access. So although we are seeing more women in these um, SMEs, their businesses tend to be smaller, and their businesses also tend to be less profitable because of some of these constraints. And so even as we invest in in SMEs, we have to start thinking about how we create more equity um, in in that in that space. How we close the gap in financial inclusion and how we address some of the labor the labor constraints uh, to your first question on on dietary diversity although we are seeing more consumption of processed foods in urban areas than in rural areas we are really seeing a huge increase in the last couple of years in the consumption of 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 um, including fast foods uh, in in rural areas, and that's why I'm saying about eighty percent of the food produced in rural areas is actually moving out of rural areas, and there's a lot of consumption of purchased um, of purchased food as well. So even as we get concerned about dietary diversity and and the adequacy of of diets, the how di how healthy diets are in for urban consumers we must also think about that for 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 our, for rural consumers as well thank you jemima